Welcome to the LinkedIn Presents Redefining Work podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt. And today we are going to be talking about a lot of things, but we're going to be talking about two topics that are certainly front of mind for many of us right now, which is AI and DEI. And there are a few people better suited to have this conversation than today's guest, Marcus Sawyer. So Marcus is the founder and CEO of EQ.app. He is the former president of the ADECO Group X. He is somebody who has spent his career in innovation and kind of emerging markets and tools and resources. And that is a wealth of perspective that I'm excited to dig into for all of you in the next 30 minutes. So Marcus, how are you, man? Welcome to the show. Um, let's have you open with an introduction for the audience. Well, firstly, Lars, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm doing great and just excited to have this discussion just as an opening. I mean, you, you've done a great job there. If I was to add any more color, I've spent last, I was actually 20, to what, around 18 years in HR tech and recruiting. So looking at everything that is going to be in the new frontier um, and how we innovate um, around that or in that. So I spent 10 years at careerbuilder.com when people were advertising in these things called newspapers. Um, and um, there was this big discussion around whether or not uh, the internet would be a thing for people to advertise jobs. So that was kind of like my first uh, I want to say time in HR tech and recruiting and kind of looking at what's next. And I started in Europe. So as you can probably tell, I've got a London accent. So I spent the majority of my career there and then moved to the ADECO group to lead digital transformation and innovation, which meant we were buying, building and investing in HR tech companies all around the world. And um, more recently turned my attention to a really important topic uh, to me, which is inclusion, but also with um, AI. So ensuring that we include people in the next wave, in the next generation of work um, by building EQ.app, which started as a community first um, and now provides an AI companion for recruiters to save time. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to, I have a lot of questions about EQ.app, but let's do a little bit of level setting um, for the audience uh, before we kind of dig into that. And let's start with just the current state of AI. And I feel like the pace of AI is moving so fast right now, we have to timestamp this conversation. So we're recording this in early April. When this runs, it will not be early April. I'm sure there'll be some new advancements and news and trends uh, at that point. But, uh, you know, April, beginning of April, beginning of Q2, describe the current state of AI. You've been working in this space for a while. You've obviously seen it evolve. You've seen the rapid uh, shift of it. And obviously, coupled with your experience, in HR tech, I would love to just get your perspective. Like when you are talking to people about the state of AI today, specifically in kind of HR and the world of work, how do you describe it? Where are we? So I'll give you the headline first and then I'll back into that. I think we're at greenfield, blue ocean opportunities within AI, within our space in particular. So five years ago, I'd done a talk for LinkedIn around the future of recruiting and the future of AI. And I made some predictions and it's random that they've come out kind of like five years later. But the predictions were, we would have the ability to have our own models that we would train. Those models would perform tasks for us. And um, we've seen a lot of that. We, we all know the, the big names that have been in the AI space. But I think more recently, the state has been um, for companies, I'm going to talk about different stakeholders at a company level, Hey, like we've got to get this um, in our quarterly quarterly meetings and our quarterly reports. We got to talk about it. So there was a big PR push, I think, overall, right, um, for general companies. Then I think what you've started to see is now we've talked about it. What are we going to do about it? So now there's a lot of auditing going on inside of organisations where they're trying to figure out where the wins are. Is it an efficiency play or is it a net new opportunity? Now, that trickles down to the employees, obviously, because every company is made up of individuals. And the employees are kind of trying, there's some uncertainty, as we know. Like, what is this going to mean for my job? Is this going to exist? And within TA, we sit, some, I say we just being in the industry, we sit somewhere in between that, right? Like, we're managing the company expectations and trying to manage the employee expectations. And if you're a global TA leader, you're managing your team's expectations, so I think that there's a lot of research going on. There's a lot of development happening right now. And then people are trying to figure out the most practical use cases that are relevant to their industry. 
and then also relevant to their business. So that's where where I feel we are today. And then there's this kind of like barrage of like separating the wheat from the chaff, like yeah. all this information coming that you constantly like, is it real? Is this going to take our jobs? Is it not? So there's there's a bit of that going on as well. So a bit of uncertainty, I would say. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, you you work with a ton of recruiters and you come from this space and you know AI in the context of recruiting as well as anybody. Like what what use cases are you excited about? Because I think, you know, there's there's an infinite number of use cases, right? Like you can use these tools to do almost anything. Should you? Absolutely not. There are some things you definitely should use it for, but there are a lot of very practical use cases. And I'm curious to get your perspective. Like what 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 are some of the things that our audience um, who is involved in recruiting should be thinking about ways that they can leverage these tools today. Yeah, and, and, and I'll answer the question and I'll try and think about it maybe in a slightly different way on, on how I suggest people should think about what the use cases are that make sense for them. And yeah. I always come up with, the, the framework is like four Ps, purpose, what are you trying to achieve? Like what are you really trying to get done um, at company level and maybe at department level within recruiting? And then the problem that you're trying to solve. And I'll give a specific one. Let's say the problem is there's just too much admin. Our recruiters are not spending enough time with stakeholders. They're not spending enough time speaking to the right candidates. Um, So once you've got that down, then you want to think about the people who's involved in that AI and then profit. How are you going to make money from it? So I think some of the use cases are, again, where there's high frequency administration work. How do you remove that? Generating job descriptions, really easy one. Making those jobs inclusive convert those jobs into job ads, and then taking those ads and distributing them to the right places and targeting applicants. A lot of that, we've actually been doing behind the scenes for a long time. A lot of companies, a few companies have had access to that that intel and information. I think we're going to start to see more, um, instead of more push, more pull, meaning we'll go out and find and pinpoint these purple squirrels that no one was able to find. And I look at AI as a way of um, in the recruiting industry, our, our, our business is all about uh, wisdom and knowledge. How do we take data and take that data, transform it into information that's useful? And we've had this information on sites like Google, different platforms. Take those that information, transform it into insights. And then once you've got those insights, make sure that your department's knowledgeable about what you're doing so you can then drive wisdom. And I think that you do that by getting down to the inf- the, the insights that you want as quick as possible. Yeah. And then distributing that to the right stakeholders at the right time. So a lot of it is taking the administration work out so you can spend more time building relationships and building better experiences for your stakeholders and your candidates. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm curious from your side as well, like, like, what are you seeing and what are you hearing that's going on in the market as well? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that there's some there's some practices that are um, are easy to kind of implement now. Like, uh, uh, for instance, um, you know, Will Blaze, who's a recruiter, I'll, I'll you know credit him for this because he's the one who shared it. He created a custom GPT to get aggregate feedback from candidate interviews and then package that feedback in an anonymous, um, uh, proactive way. Like, you know, he shared the prompt that he created to do this. So basically, if you, you know, you interview five candidates on site, you're going to make an offer to hopefully one who accepts. That's four people you're rejecting. And typically, we're kind of not great at providing feedback that's actionable for those candidates. And we're not really thinking about candidate experience, especially in this environment where we're, recruiters tend to be overwhelmed with applicants. He created a custom prompt that basically would allow them to enter the greenhouse notes um, from the interview teams for people who they rejected the prompt would compile the notes in a way that made it actionable feedback, pros, cons, et cetera, that he could then share back to candidates. Um, And I thought that was a really clever use case. Basically, he had ChatGPT Plus, created a custom GPT for it, and um, and open sourced that. And so again, like that's something if you're like, hey, conceptually, I get it, but like specifically, practically, what can I do? Like that's something you can do now. And if you have ChatGPT Plus, you know, it's not uh, putting that information that you're entering into the overall kind of external uh, LLM. So from a privacy perspective, still take out any identifying information. But um, but that, that was a, a really valuable use case. I saw another around basically compiling um, notes. So having intake notes when you're kicking off a search uh, and you're meeting with all the different stakeholders, you've got a range of notes, using those notes, feeding those into ChatGPT or whatever tool you're using to create a job description 
uh, and then from the job description, create interview guides that could even be, for example, like values aligned, right? So if you, if you have a structured interviews where you're trying to really have different people on the interview team dig into different value alignment based on the job description, you can do that and you can leverage these tools to do that. You could do that manually as a human, but it's going to sure. take you a lot of time, right? And sure. so I think what a lot of these tools do now in recruiting and elsewhere is they kind of, I use the analogy that they give you a running start to a lot of what you want to do. Are they going to be turnkey and cut and paste? No, uh, they're not. You're going to have to have human intervention. You're going to have to refine them. And there's issues with hallucination and things like that you have to be mindful of. Um, but they can give you a running start at almost anything. And so those were just two kind of specific use cases that I saw recently that kind of caught my attention. Yeah. I, and I think, so one of the things I think about is, is personalization at scale. And how do you, and to your point, like the interview yeah. guides or like making sure that you've got notes that are very specific for that particular conversation. Um, everybody, we all know about the black hole, like candidate applies, they hear nothing back, they don't know why. And I think if you can continue to leverage the AI to personalize at scale, that's when you start to build relationships. Um, so yeah. I, that, that, that's that been one of the use case. Research for us is a, is a big thing. So before you go into meetings or calls for the intake calls, you know the situation. So you save more time in that discussion kind of level setting, right? Because that's always like 15 minutes of a call, right? At the start. Yeah. Of it. You know, it's, it's interesting when you say that. Like, uh, so I, I generally use uh, ChatGPT for a lot of my queries, um, but I started using Copilot a bit more. And, and what was interesting is, you know, Copilot is embedded now natively into Google Chrome. And so I was running a search in Google and I was looking up somebody who I was going to be meeting and I have a custom GPT prompt to create like a dossier or a profile on individuals that I'm going to be meeting with so I can learn a bit more about their background and not have to do that research manually. Uh, but what I, I just, in this case, I just did because I was looking for a specific thing. I just did a Google search and then I saw Copilot actually did that on the right side of the browser without me prompting. And I was like, this is actually pretty good. It's pretty good. So it's, uh, you know, and again, I think, I think we don't realize like how early we are in how AI will just become ubiquitous in the tools that we use. And I think as they become more integrated into our email, you know, decks, all these different tools that we're using, um, we're going to be interfaced with AI. We may not even know it, right? It's just going to be kind of seamlessly integrated. Yeah, I, th I think invisible AI is a thing. And it's been yeah. a thing for a while, right? And as far as like the research, so I've done the same for you before our meeting on EQ Buddy. Yeah. So um, we use that for research all the time and it pulled in, okay, like these are the things that last last done with Amplifier. This is what you've done with Ticket Ticketmaster. These are the, and so you get a full picture. And obviously like we've had conversations and I'm aware, but it's like a nice refresher. Yeah. So then we can just hit the ground running and have the discussion. So I think AI should be there to support you in having more, sensible, meaningful, and youthful conversations with human beings. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, like I, what, what I'm an aspect of AI that I'm bullish on and we're not there yet, but I don't know how far away we are is that career sites, I think will become dynamic and conversational in nature. And, you know, I think when you look at how we recruit fundamentally today, really hasn't changed in 20 years, 30 years, right? Like we used to advertise in the paper, as you mentioned earlier, right? Now we have digital ads. We used to have paper, you know, uh, paper resumes that we would print and hand you physically. You know, now we have digital resumes and LinkedIn and other tools. Um, we still have humans kind of making the connections between all those things. But I think we're not that far off from career sites where basically you visit, I'm interested in a cure at a career at, uh, let's say, you know, at EQ, I want to come, come work with you. And there's a, a chat interface that I'm basically having a conversation with. And hey, uh, you know, upload your CV, upload your LinkedIn profile, upload any other links to blogs or things that you think would be pertinent to understand uh, your background. What is it you're interested in? What do you like doing, right? Like, I think so much of our, the way that we recruit is like, let me look at a resume, which is usually a retrospective look at what you've done and match that with a job description, which is an unrealistic, uh, you know, overly dense things of wish list items that, you know, that this person will do and making that connection. And I think in that near future where we're using conversational AI as part of the job engine, you know, through that conversational, maybe it's a two to three minute conversational chat, it will serve you up jobs that 
you knew that would be in line with what you do, right? Like I'm a software engineer. It's going to show me some software engineer jobs, but it's also going to identify transferable skills based on my experience and my interest and aptitude that uh, are probably jobs I might not have thought about. And yeah. it's like, hey, but actually these other jobs, you would be a 70% match for or an 80% match for. And I think to me, like that's going to be the, the real kind of turning of the corner in recruiting because we're not going to necessarily be so locked into like like for like from a skills and job description standpoint. Um, we are going to be able to identify potential fit for roles that open up new career opportunities to people. It broadens our talent pool. Um, I'm excited for that. I don't have a timetable yet on that, but the way things are progressing, like I don't think it's that far out. I mean, it may have sounded like science fiction five years ago. I don't, I don't think it is anymore. I mean, you, you're, you know, you're deeply embedded in HR tech. Uh, when do you think we're gonna see something like that? Well, I, I think um, a lot of it is happening as we speak and you, you know, the the, the big um, uh, quote, right? The future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Yeah. And so there's somebody doing that right now, but right. not at any scale. And I think that that's going to, one of the biggest question marks at the moment is adoption within AI. And you mentioned some really interesting points around things that are happening seamlessly beh behind the scenes, which I call invisible AI. And that's been happening forever on Amazon, Netflix, even on some of the, the matches. So on the consumer side, that's been happening. I think within our industry, there's going to be a reckoning that happens. And the reckoning is going to be, do we make this particular module invisible or do we make it transparent? And that's going to depend on who's operating the AI. Yeah. Are recruiters operating the AI or is this a senior leadership initiative to remove maybe what they would to make it make that organization leaner and we're seeing that happening a lot and i think that's a question mark for those in ta really to try and figure out where are the jobs going to be if you look inside of your organization is your company hiring more logo designers right if they're creative probably not um you but you what you might do is you might have a, a head of design that is able to inspect the quality of that so i think that there's going to be a lot of value in those uh folks and those individuals that are able to inspect what they expect. Lawyers, uh, doctors, they're going to be training the AIs moving forward and we're going to see this kind of vertical push. So I'm probably not answering your question um, directly, but what I would say is like skills-based hiring is going to be a thing for those that also operate the AI as well. And that's why we're so focused on recruiters because we think they, we've, they've got amazing skills that need to be amplified um, yeah. Excuse the pun, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the check is in the mail. I appreciate the plug. Uh, um, I want to transition to another topic that I know you're passionate about, which is inclusion. And I want to just kind of level set. It'll be a great segue to get into um, EQ. But before we do so, I just want to get your thoughts on the current state of DEI today. And, you know, I think as we're having this conversation, we're doing this in the backdrop of a lot of very loud and vocal pundits um, trying to come out and demonize DEI efforts, um, programs, and frankly, using you know the term DEI and taking that in the same way that they had taken the concept of woke and kind of weaponized that. And so we're we're in an you know I know this is a generational effort uh, and and progress is always both you know it's nonlinear. But I'm curious to get your perspective kind of today, like where, how do you kind of describe and, and see the, the state of DEI as we think about it from a kind of HR and recruiting and workplace standpoint? Yeah, so if, if I think about DEI at large, I think there are some companies that have made these stances and stands and they're going to stick by them. And they are looking at ways of working between in between the the quote unquote rules, as it were, right? Um, and they are committed, and but those types of companies were also committed for a long period of time. Then you've got maybe a, a, another population that was a little bit performative, or, or very performative, should I say, and looked at the PR of things that were going on and saying, okay, well, if we don't do something, we're going to be seen as this type of company. And our employees may leave, and they were kind of doing it for the wrong reason. So they'd stick somebody in DNI um, or diversity, and they would say, "Here you go, you've got to try and change things." But there's no budget, and there's no support, 
and those those are those are now falling behind and you kind of see them dying out but people that have been in the space and really care about it are, are watching those companies and you're seeing it and i actually think medium and longer term that's going to be a really negative impact for those businesses not just from a standpoint of like how they're viewed but from a business standpoint and i always lean yeah. into this i think that uh, diversity and inclusion has shown like many many times that it's just better for business and i always give the analogy of look if we're at a board boardroom uh, and we're looking at an object in the middle of the table and you're one side i'm the other side we need the other people on the left hand side and the right hand side to make out what that object is and that's what um, inclusion provides which is perspective and so I think at the moment, you're going to have some companies that are going to lean into this. And I think longer term, they're going to be successful. And then there are going to be more co- some organizations that are now going to stop doing this and now jump on the next bandwagon. And basically, they'll, they'll see, OK, well, if it's business as usual, we'll, we'll be just fine. But I think they're going to struggle at some point. They're going to hit a glass ceiling. So I, I think right now, DNI has not got the momentum that it had historically. But at the same token, that's going to come to the detriment of some of those companies that aren't leaning into them. And also inside of the companies where you've hired maybe someone that is aware, they're conscious, they know what you're doing, that narrative is not going to look good for you when they leave also as well. Um, but ultimately, my, my opinion on d and I always put the I first, and you kind of said it a few times, which is inclusion. I think for companies overall, if you include more people, it's going to be better for your employees and you're going to be able to then go into new markets as well because you're going to have more of an inclusive approach. Um, but I think overall, there's still a lot of work to be done and it's infinite. It doesn't stop. So those that really care about it will continue fighting the good yeah. fight um, and driving things forward. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And particularly the fact that there's no end to this work. Like there's no finish line. There's never a point where if you are committed to this work, that you're like, oh, okay, we're there. We we we've reached the we've reached our goals. Uh, that just doesn't happen. And then let's kind of come back into the the inclusion piece because I know that was a big driver for you in creating EQ. So could you maybe just walk me through the origin story? Like, how did the how did the platform come to be? I know you mentioned it started as a community, kind of grew to an app. Like, w- at what point were you? Was this kind of a, an idea in your mind? You were like, hmm, this may be something to explore to you know, you kind of getting out there and saying, yeah, that time is now I'm going to, I'm going to build this and kind of give a, a bit of an overview of the evolution and where the product sits today. Yeah. So I've always been somebody that's been big on bringing people together, um, to achieve stuff that you cannot achieve as an individual. And when I was, um, at a deco, I, I got to a point where I was on boards. I was in, I was on a board at Microsoft services. I was in a few other different boardrooms and, not particularly those places, but I just started to look around the people I was meeting. I just thought there was less and less people that had a similar background to me. Um, and then COVID hit. And during that time, I had a lot of reflection time. I went on a lot of runs and I was just running every single day. And I was kind of thinking and running, thinking and running. And I thought to myself, what, what am I really passionate about? And it's helping people at large. Um, what do I know the recruiting industry and where's there an opportunity? And the opportunity is to bring people in to something that can help them uh, support themselves and support their families long term. So I, I firstly got a small group of people together. Um, it's like friends and family of people that I knew and created uh, like a community based app where we would have discussions around things that are called the four C's, which were careers that were meaningful, uh, conversations that could make a real difference to you, like whether that was in your life I and mean, connections. How do you get connections to open doors, which ultimately led to capital? And I thought with that formula, there's something there to help people uh, move to the next level. But you then needed the demand side. And the demand side was, who's going to hire? And I started consulting with some venture capital firms and a few other organizations around their DNI programs across their portfolios of companies. And what we noticed is that everybody said they wanted to do something but didn't know how. So my initial thought was to remove the barrier of, I don't know how. We will help you get access to talent from different backgrounds for mid to senior level roles. So that's how we started um, EQ initially. And the mission has always been empowering people to thrive. And that's really what we stand for. And we were making money and just driving revenue by being a permanent placement business on the back end, but automating a lot of those parts of it. So you'd have the community on one side. Uh, Then we would get job 
roles that would come in. We would then match those jo- those candidates to those positions, and we would do a, a process of sourcing, curation, and then introductions. So we were acting as the third introduction to our clients. But what we were doing to get that talent in is we were providing um, non-biased job descriptions. Um, we were making sure that the filtering and the sourcing and ranking was in, in relation to the population of the United States in particular, we were making sure that we were removing as much bias as we could from the, pro, pro, uh, the process. And we were partnering with a lot of staffing and recruiting firms at the time. We found that if we can do that internally, maybe there's a way to productize this. And then AI came back on the scene and we started to figure out all the processes that we were doing. What could we provide as a service to our clients so they could do this themselves internally? And this is where we had developed EQ Buddy. So last year, May, we started to take a hard pivot and start to move more into providing a product that companies could use for inclusion, but leveraging AI to find the best talent as well. Yeah. So walk me through how that works. Like if I'm a, if I'm working at a client using EQ Buddy, what is what is that experience like for me? Yeah. So you have a conversational interface. Um, you can you log in. You ask EQ Buddy a series of things that you would like to get done. Whether that was generate a job description and it will generate an inclusive job description in under three seconds for your particular type of role. If you want to then hit match, you can then source candidates that would match against those job descriptions. And then if you want to then reach out to them, there's a button in there, which we call the easy button. You just press the easy button, it would generate a personalized message for you to outreach to them, and then you can get connected with them. So that's like one example of a flow. Um, A lot of folks are also using it to find communities that are in their, their kind of area of expertise, whether it's their industry that may not show up on things like Google. So we basically indexed the entire internet, but for the purposes of recruiting. Um, So at the moment, as you know, like Google and different platforms, they they work really, really well for if your site is indexed for SEO purposes. We're really trying to find the purple squirrels, the needles in the haystack, the communities that you might not see and give them that visibility on the platform. So it's a conversational interface where you can go and just chat to it um, and ask it what you want. And then it will lead you to the sources. We always provide the sources. So you can go directly to the sources where you get that information. Yeah. How, like from a sourcing perspective, what, what is the backend? Like, does it integrate to your ATS? So you're like tapping into past applicants? Does it integrate to LinkedIn? Like how, how, how is it pulling candidates uh, at that point? Yeah, so the, like as we were talking about earlier, kind of a lot, lot of the research, there's a lot of information that already exists about you and about me, but it's not in one place. Yeah. So we aggregate that all into one place and find all of the links on where people may live. So for one person, you might have five or 10 different social sites that you're looking for. So that's one way to do it. As far as like the ATS, um, we have an open API um, and we start, we're starting to integrate with a few enterprise clients. But right now it's like product led growth. You can go on, get a free trial, try it out for yourself and just get access um, immediately. We are thinking about the companies that we should start to do integrations with, but we want to make sure they're aligned to kind of our mission and vision as well. And we've got good partners there. So yeah, um, yeah that, that's, that's how it works right now. Well, important question here. Uh, where can listeners and viewers uh, get the app? You mentioned it's a free trial. Uh, people want to check it out. Where, where can they do so? Yeah, so they can do, uh, they can go on to a, a link that says eq.app and then directly on that link, um, you can get access. We'll also, uh, for following this, we'll create a special code for Lars. So if you do, EQ, if you add in Lars Schmidt, then you will get a discount. And Lars and I are going to discuss what that discount should be. So you should say that. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking news. Out. This yeah, is exactly. great. No, that's exactly. awesome. I, I appreciate that. We'll definitely share that in the uh, Amplify Talent community as well. Um, when do you, let's, I, you know, predictions are so hard, I, but I'm going to leave you with a prediction. Um, actually, I'm going to leave you with a question about a prediction. Like when you, when you think about how AI, the velocity of adoption of AI, especially in, you know, just, the world of work, right? We're seeing companies like Klarna, you know, have a tool that's replacing customer service representatives. We're seeing Cognition having tools that are, you know, allegedly able to replace software engineers. And so we'll, you know, we will start to see the impact on the loss of jobs through AI this year. We will also see jobs being gained in different areas. So it's not a net net, you know, complete loss, but, um, 
fast forward a year. It's not fair to ask to do anything more than a year. Yeah. So I, I won't do that. But like we're having this conversation in April 2025. Like, what do you think the world of work is going to be looking like as it relates to like how we're leveraging AI in HR and recruiting? So I uh- I think it depends on the level that you're operating at. And I'll, I'll break it down a little bit. I think if you're an executive search, not much will change apart from the fact that you have more knowledge and, uh, around your candidates because you kind of operate like an agency model, like a sports team, where you have the stable of candidates that you take out to market. I think for the high frequency, high volume, so if we go into the other end of the spectrum, you're going to see that the majority of the administration tasks are automated fully end-to-end when communicating with candidates until they are on assignment. So I think that you're going to start to, to see that. Then if you if you kind of flip it slightly and you think about who your stakeholders are, I think there's going to be an expectation that when you're speaking to a stakeholder that you know more about the stakeholder than you would otherwise. Like when the internet first came out, it's like, oh, you didn't Google that person or do your research. I think right. research is going, to, is going to be like table stakes. So that, building those relationships is going to be down to how much you know about those individuals and how proactive you are. So I think the state of recruitment will become more proactive than reactive. And I think that's good news for those that are thinking about what's next. And also good news for those that want to let go of parts of their job that are repetitive, their administration, and so on and so forth. So I think that's the next year. Um, and I'll go a little bit further because you did put, we did we did kind of mention that 18 to 24 months. I think at some point it's going to be, there's going to be parts that are going to be fully autonomous. And those parts will be uh, what I'll call plays. So you'll press play and there'll be a part of that workflow that will be fully autonomous. It might be from, hey, Lars, um, you want to find a UX designer. We'll do everything all the way through that process with using AI to get those UX designers in your calendar tomorrow. I think all you have to do is request a UX designer and that's going to yeah. happen. That might be 18, 24 months out. So anything that you're doing in between that isn't about having a, a sensible, reasonable, useful conversation with a stakeholder, it won't really matter. The AI will be able to do that better. Yeah. You know, that, that last use case that you gave I like that because I also think, I mean, I like that obviously from a recruiting perspective, right? Efficiency is great. Uh, but I also like that because I think that the, you know, the way that we think about employment is also changing, right? Like we're, we're not joining companies where we expect to be there for five or more years. Um, they're certainly not expecting to have us for, you know, that long. And we've seen all the layoffs, particularly in tech in the U.S. over the last couple of years. And I think that there's, there's less of a sense of loyalty between the employee-employer relationship. Um, so I think, you know, people, we, we used to talk about active or passive job seekers. I don't know that that really matters anymore. It's, it's talent and it's, it's openness or not. And it doesn't really matter whether you're active. If you're open, I, I can have a conversation with you, you know, in theory. And so maybe there is a platform where like you opt in and say, Hey, like I'm a UX designer, like in your scenario. Um, sure. I'd want to hear about companies that offer X, Y, and Z. Here are my criteria. If you, if somebody presses the find me a UX designer in a company that matches that criteria, uh, go ahead. Here's my calendar. Schedule a meeting. Like I, I, that doesn't sound like science fiction. Like I think that also is consistent with how, you know, I think different generations now are thinking about the employer employee relationship. So, um, Marcus, we, we, we could go on for, uh, another hour. I think we're gonna have to get a part two of this. Uh, but I, I do want to be mindful of time. And your time, uh, what is the best way if uh, the audience wants to, you know, follow your work after the podcast, what's the best way for them to do that? Simple way is on, on LinkedIn. So just uh, first name, last name with two R's on LinkedIn. Um, and then I'll, I, I typically p- post and publish information and stuff that we're doing uh, mainly there. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, on eq.app, um, we'll, we have blogs and articles and resources around leveraging and using AI. Great. Well, keep, uh, keep up the work. I appreciate your leadership and your voice in this space. I like learning from you and uh, grateful for you to make time to allow the audience to uh, learn from you as well. No, really appreciate the time, Lars, and honored to be on the pod and uh, yeah, excited to hear all the feedback from your community. Okay. All right. Have a good day. Cheers.